Hello, I welcome you to your favorite YouTube channel, Physics for Everybody. Today, we'll be solving the October-November 2023 um, Cambridge GCSE Physics 0625, paper 4, variant 1. Without delay, let's go straight to the first question. Question number one. A girl holds a rubber ball out of a window of a building. The mass of the ball is 0.2 kilogram. The ball is at least 10 meters above a concrete part. Calculate the gravitational potential energy of the ball relative to the concrete part. Okay, so this is just the diagram to represent um, what is happening. The mass of the ball is 0.2 kilogram. Gravitational field strength. Do not forget that from this um, syllabus, gravitational field strength will be taken as a 9.8 meter per second square or 9.8 newton per kilogram. Yeah, so let's substitute those values into the equation. What's the formula for gravitational potential energy? Gravitational potential energy is mass multiplied by gravitational field strength multiplied by height. The mass of the ball is 0.2 kilogram. Gravitational field strength is 9.8. The height of the building is 10 meters. So we multiply 0 0.2 times 9.8 times 0 0.2 times 9.8 times 10. This gives us 19.6 um, Newton. 19.6 19.6 Joules, rather. Joules, gravitational potential energy. Energy is measured in Joules. So 19.6 joules, okay? And look at all the values we have. All the values we have are given to, to one significant figure, 0 0.2, 10. So let's write our answer to one significant figure. That will be 20 joules. Excellent. We go straight to the second part of the question. The girl releases the ball and it falls towards the part. The ball strikes the part and bounces vertically upwards, okay? The speed of the ball immediately before it strikes the part is 40 meters per second. This is the initial speed, 40 meters per second. The speed of the ball immediately after it strikes the part is 12 meters per second. This is the final speed. Okay? Calculate the kinetic energy of the ball immediately after it strikes the concrete part. Okay, kinetic energy, kinetic energy equals to half mv squared. Okay, so we have half multiplied by the mass of the ball is 0 0.2 kilogram, as we saw in the previous um, question. And the velocity of the ball, v, after, after, that's velocity after stacking the parts, which is 12. So we have 12 squared. Okay, yeah, because half mv squared. v is 12 squared. So we have half times 0 0.2, this will give us 0 0.1, multiplied by 12 raised to the power 2, that's 12 times 12, which will give you 144. 144 multiplied by 0 0.1, that will give us 14.4. That will give us 14.4 joules, okay? Since our, our values here are written to two, decimal, two significant figures, we write the answer to two significant figures, that's 14 joules. Excellent. The third part of the question. Show that the change in momentum of the ball when it bounces off the part is 5.2 kilogram meters per second. What's the formula for change in momentum? You know, impulse equals to change in momentum. Okay, yeah, but we are not interested in the impulse. We're interested in a change in momentum. Change in momentum, change in momentum is mass multiplied by change in velocity, m into v minus u. What is um, the mass? The mass is 0 0.2 kilogram. What is the final velocity? Final velocity is 12 meters per second. What's initial velocity? Ideally, initial velocity is 14 meters per second. But take note of direction. Velocity is the vector quantity. Now look at this. The ball fell downwards. The ball fell downward. This is the ball. It fell downwards. It was, it had a velocity of 40 meters per second before hitting the floor. Then it hit the floor and bounced up upwards at the velocity of 12 meters per second. So its velocity 
While moving downwards, before hitting the floor, his velocity was 14 meters per second. So the ball hit the floor and bounced back upward. After hitting the floor and bouncing back upward, it bounced upward with a velocity of 12 meters per second. Take note that this is the final velocity, the 12 meters per second, while the 14 meters per second is the initial velocity. Let me use different colors so everything does not look, um, does not um, mix up. So the ball fell downwards. I'm using color red to represent the motion of the ball downwards. It landed on the floor and bounced back upwards. It landed on the floor with a velocity of 14 meters per second. While when it, it was time for it to bounce back upwards, it bounced back upwards with a velocity of 12 meters per second. Okay. Now look at this arrow. Velocity is a vector quantity. We are taking the final velocity as a... Um, the direction of interest, okay? So the direction of velocity here is positive. Since initially the ball traveled downwards, then we are taking the direction of the initial velocity to be negative, okay? Yeah, why? Velocity is a vector quantity. So we can't take both of them to be positive. One will be positive, the other will be negative because the ball traveled in opposite direction. When it hit the floor, it traveled in opposite direction. So taking 14 as make taking 12 as positive, then 14 becomes negative. Why? Because the direction of 14 is opposite. Okay, is opposite. Is opposite the direction of the 12. The direction of the 12 is upwards. Yeah. So forget how slant this line is, just so that um, everything does not um, look like one single line. Yeah. So that's the point here. Okay. Yeah. So our final velocity is 14, is um, 12. Initial velocity is minus 14. Let me, now let's substitute these values into this formula for change in momentum, okay? Change in momentum is M, uh, hold on, yeah, M open bracket V minus U, and the mass is 0 0.2, final velocity is 12, minus, initial velocity is minus 14, minus 14. Let me put this minus 14 in a bracket, okay? And then close the entire bracket. So I have 0 0.2, open bracket, 12, minus multiply by minus, that will be plus, plus 14. Okay, so this will give me 0 0.2, and then 12 plus 14, that will be 26. If I multiply 0 0.2 by 26, I will get 5.6. And you put the SI in it, kilogram meters per second. That has been shown, okay? That has been shown. We go straight to the next part of the question. The ball is in contact with the path for 0 0.25 seconds. Calculate the average resultant force on the ball when it is in contact with the path. What's the formula for force? Force is equal to um, change in momentum divided by change in time. Okay, yeah, um, force is the time rate of change of momentum in line with the Newton's second law of motion. So the change in momentum is what we calculated in the previous part of the question, which is 5.6. And the change in time, the time taken is 0 0.25. If we divide 5.6 by 0 0.25, that's the same thing as multiplying 5.6 by 4. Sorry, 0 0.25. 5.6 divided by 0 0.25, that will be 11.2, And then, um, okay, yeah, this is given to two different figures. Let me just use calculator for that. 5.6 divided by 0 0.25. 22.4, whoa. 22.4. 22.4 Newton, excellent. Okay, that's all for number one, okay? Yeah, so we go straight to question number two. My Target is 10 minutes per question. A copper cooking pan contains water. Figure 2.1 shows the pan on a hot plate of a cooker. Copper is a metal. Thermal energy is conducted through all solids by lattice vibrations. Describe one other way in which thermal energy is conducted through the copper. Copper is a metal and metals have um, free electrons. Okay, yeah. So um, this question has three marks, so we should put um, three points there. You should have three valid points. You get it? Yeah. Um, describe one other way through 
through um, free electrons. Okay. So we have to describe it. So how do you describe it? Let's go. Okay, so before we take um, question number two, um, my staff here just did my attention to something. They said um, 0 0.2 multiplied by 26 are supposed to get um, 5.2. So how about that? 5.2, because we have to show that this is equal to 5.2. If you use your calculator to multiply this, you get 5.2. So I have to fix that now. So this will be 5.2 multiplied by 0 0.25. 5.2 divided by 0 0.25. So if you divide 5.2 by 0 0.25, you get 11.8. Sorry. 5.2, 10. 10.4 times 2, that will be 20.8. Yeah, you get 20.8. Sorry about that. Yeah, that will be 20.8. 20.8. Yeah, so since our answer, our value, the, um, our values are given to maximum of two significant figures. Two significant figures. So we write our answer to two significant figures. That should be 21 newtons. Okay, yeah, so that has been fixed. Now, come back to this question. Um, describe one other way in which thermal energy is conducted through copper. You know, copper is a metal, and metals have um, free electrons, okay? So we're going to state it here that the metals have um, free delocalized electrons. Okay, that's the first um, point. Then what else? How does that work? You know, the electrons are free to move about. Though the, the particles of the solid are fixed. They can only vibrate about their fixed position. But the electron, if this is an electron, electron is free to move about. And it goes to transmit, um, it carries thermal energy and deposit it at um, distant particles. You get it, yeah. And that way, thermal energy begins to flow from a region of higher temperature to a region of lower temperature. You know, heat flows from a region of higher temperature to a region of lower temperature, yeah. So that's how metals conduct some heat. So I'm going to type it here now. So I had to pause the video while typing the answer in order to save time, okay? So that the video, the video will not be too long. Thermal energy is conducted through all solid by lattice vibration. Describe one other method. Which other method is that? That's by the free electron. What happened? Copper being a metal, that means it has them free or mobile electrons, right? Good. Now, the electrons receive thermal energy from the hot plate, directly from the hot plate, or they receive thermal energy from the hotter metal particles. That simply means the, the electrons that are closer to the hot plate, they can gain thermal energy and move to distant electrons and deposit their energies there, okay? Yeah, so that's what happens. The electrons are free to move. Or the electrons can gain energy from hotter particles, and then transmit the energy, okay? As they are moving, they are colliding with the colder particles. And during the collision, they deposit their thermal energy on the colder particles. That's all. The electrons move freely to distance particles and collide with them and deposit their thermal energy in the process. Easy, of course it is. The outside surface of the cooking pan is kept clean by regular polishing. Explain one other advantage of keeping the surface of the pan shiny. And you know, um, 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 matte surface, matte surfaces, okay, or you say a dull black surface is a very good absorber of um, radiant energy and also a good transmitter. But a shiny surface, a shiny silver surface is a poor transmitter of um, radiant energy, also a poor receiver. So when this surface is shiny, it simply means this surface will not transmit heat to the external environment. It retains, it just keeps the heat within the pot. Okay, hence the, the food will not lose thermal energy quick, quickly. Okay, yeah, and that simply means the food can get cooked quicker. But if the food was, if the pot was, um, if this pan was sending out heat by radiation, it means this pot will be getting colder. It will be losing energy at a faster rate. Okay, so keeping it shiny, means it won't give out heat and it won't lose heat quickly and your food will get um, cooked quicker. So this one advantage of keeping the outer surface of the pot shiny, I'll write it here. So that is the answer to the question, okay? Shiny surfaces are poor emitters of heat by radiation, okay? Hence the pan retains almost all its heat and the food cooks faster. The next part of the question, 
the thermal energy passes into water through the base of the pan. Identify the main method by which thermal energy is transferred throughout the water. Water is a liquid, and the method of its transfer in liquid and gases is convection. So you put your answer there as convection. That's all. We go straight to question number three. Liquids are difficult to compress, whereas gases can be compressed easily. Explain in terms of particles why it is difficult to compress liquids. Why is it difficult to compress liquids? Because the liquid particles are, are closer together in comparison with them gas particles, okay? Because the distance between the particles is very, very small, okay? And since this is a two marks question, you have to give them two valid um, reasons, two valid points, okay? So the other um, reason can be the force of repulsion between the um, adjacent particles. The force of repulsion between two neighboring particles of a liquid is higher in comparison with the force of repulsion between um, two adjacent, two neighboring particles of, of a gas, okay? In the case of solids, the force of repulsion is small in comparison with the force of attraction. That's why the force of attraction in solids is so great that the particles just take a fixed, rigid position. But in the case of liquid, the force of repulsion is high. Force of repulsion between adjacent particles is high. Yeah, so um, the force of repulsion, but let's start with the number one reason, the particles are closer together. Let me pause this video in order to save time. So that is the answer, okay? The distance between the, the neighboring particles is, um, distance between neighboring particles is very small. It's so small in um, liquids, okay? That's the most valid reason, okay? And the second one is because the force of repulsion between neighboring particles is very small. Force of repulsion between neighboring particles is very high, not small. It's very high. Then distance between um, neighboring particles is, is um, very small. So since the distance between two particles is very small, then little can be done in terms of compressing them. Distance between them is already small. And the force of repulsion between them is very high. So it's difficult to compress them further unlike um, gases, in which distance between the particles is very high already. Figure 3.1 shows a rectangular blob floating in water. The density of water is 1,000 kg per meter cube. So this is the rectangular block. This is the atmosphere. This is water. And the depth that is submerged in the water is 0 0.087 meters. The area of the base of the block is 0 0.014 meters square. The area of this base you know, this area would have the shape of a of a rectangle when viewed from the when you view it from this place. Okay, if you view it from here, what you see will be a rectangle. Yeah. So the area of this rectangle, rectangular base, is 0 0.08. Sorry, 0 0.014 meters square. The base of the block is at a depth of 0 0.087 meters below the surface of the water show that the pressure due to water at the base of the block is approximately 850 pascals. Um, how do you get pressure? Pressure is um, force divided by area, right? Or you say density multiplied by gravity multiplied by the depth. So we are using OGH. Pressure is density multiplied by gravitational field strength multiplied by the height, the depth. What's density of water? You are dealing with water here. Density of water is 1,000 kilogram per meter cube. 1,000 multiplied by gravitational field strength on the earth is 9.8. Then the depth of the water is 0 0.087. So we're going to multiply these three and the answer we get will be the correct answer to that question. Let's multiply. 1,000 multiplied by 9.8 multiplied by 0 0.087. 1,000 multiplied by 9.8 multiplied by 0 0.087. Eight five two. Eight five two. So eight five two. Eight fifty two. All our values are written to two significant figures. So you write our answer to two significant figures. Eight fifty um Newton per meter square or Pascal. Eight fifty. Okay, Pascal. Pascal. Yeah. So the second part of the question says, calculate the force on the base of the block. Calculate the force F on the base of the block caused by the pressure given in BII. 
And you know, pressure is force by unit area. So if you want to calculate force, the formula for force is force is um, pressure multiplied by area. Yeah. So let's multiply pressure by area. The pressure is 850. And then the cross-sectional area of the base is um, 0 0.014. 0 0.014. So, 850 multiplied by 0 0.014. That's 12. That is 12 Newton. The third part of the question. The force F is equal to the weight of the block. Calculate the mass of the block. Um, you know, force is equal to weight, and weight is mass times gravitational field strength. So if you want to get mass, you say mass is weight divided by gravitational field strength, okay? Yeah, so the mass will be the weight, which is 12, divided by 9.8. 1.2. The mass is 1.2 kilogram. 1.2. Kilogram. We go to the next part of the question. Okay, um, that's the end of that question. We go to the next question. Question number four. A radio transmitter is a very tall, thin cylinder. It is prevented from falling over by wires which have one end fixed to the transmitter and the other end fixed in the ground. Okay, so these are the wires, one end facing the transmitter, the other end facing the ground. Let's continue. The ends of the wires in the ground are long distance from the transmitter. The end of this wire is at a long distance from the transmitter. Figure 4.1 shows the transmitter and the two and two of the wires. Okay, that's fine. The center of gravity G is shown on figure 4.1. State what is meant by center of gravity. Center of gravity is the point where the entire weight of an object is concentrated. That is fine. So that is the definition of center of gravity, the point where the entire weight of an object is concentrated or where the entire weight of an object applies to lie. The next part of the question says, So the next question, the next question says, explain why the radio transmitter without wires is a very unstable structure. And why would the radio transmitter without wire be an unstable structure? It's because um, without those wires, without the wires, and you see, look at the base, very narrow. That simply means um, any little tilt, any tilting force would make the any tilting force from the, this side will make the radio transmitter fall off to the other side, okay? So that's why we have these two um, cables to ensure it is um, stable, okay? So if there is a tilting force that tries to push it this way, the cable here will resist that force, okay, because of the tension. And if there is a tilting force trying to push it this way, the cable here will resist that tilting force, okay? It will resist the tilting force. So that is how the cables work. To ensure it's um, stable. Okay, so there is the answer. Okay. Yeah, so any little tilt, any little because any little tilt pushes the center of gravity outside the base and topples the transmitter. Yeah. So any little tilt will make it um topple. That's why we have um, that. And if you want to learn more on this concept you are advised to watch the video on this link, okay? So just put this link on your browser and you'll be able to watch this video. So it will explain this concept to you better, okay? Or you just look for this video on my YouTube channel, this is for everybody. Let's go through. Wire W is under tension and it exerts a force T on the transmitter. On figure, 4.1, mark an arrow to show the force. On figure 4.1, mark an arrow to show the force T. 
exerted by wire W on the transmitter. To show the force T exerted by the wire W on the transmitter, where's the wire W? This is wire W. So, what will be the direction of the force on the transmitter? This is the transmitter. So, the force will be this way. Okay, yeah. Trying to pull it downwards in this direction. Okay, in order to resist any tilting force in this direction. Yeah, so that's how it works. The force T produces a moment on the transmitter about its base. Mark an arrow to show the force T. Where this is under tension, it exerts a force T on the transmitter. Yeah. Describe how the moment produced by T is calculated and indicate on figure 4.1 what is meant by any other terms in the description. Describe how the moment produced by T is calculated. How do you um, get the moment produced by T? This is the first T. Okay, yeah, T represents tension. This is the first T. How do you get the moment? And um, what is moment? Moment equals to force multiplied by perpendicular distance. Okay, and what distance is that? The distance between the base and um, the horizontal level where T is being attached. This height here is the distance, okay? Yeah, the height here is the distance. And what is the force? The force is, um, the, the force will be perpendicular to this height, okay? Yeah, so that will be the, the what? The horizontal component of this force here, okay? Yeah, so, this will be the horizontal component of this force. And how do you get the horizontal component of this force? Because tension is in this direction. How do you resolve tension in this direction? We need to get the angle here, okay? Or the angle here, any of them. If you call the angle here theta, then we, go, we don't need the angle here. So all we just need is T sine theta. That will give you the force. F is equal to T sine theta, okay? And the distance is equal to the height, the height of this point from the horizontal level. So since um, moment is force times distance, and we know that the force is T sine theta, so the moment is um, T sine theta multiplied by D, and that's how you get um, the moment, okay? Or you say D T sine theta, that's it. So describe how the moment produced by T is calculated and indicate in figure 4.1 what is meant by any other um, terms in the description. So those are the terms that you need. Okay, I've put all those terms on the description. I've put the height. So how would you calculate the moment? Let me remove this here so it does not cause any form of distraction. So how do you calculate the moment? That's the formula here. So um, all you just do, describe. Now this is the description. Let me pause this video so I can write the description. Okay, so that is the description. Okay, moment is equal to force multiplied by perpendicular distance from the base. And the force is the horizontal component of the tension T. Okay, yeah, and then you can um, proceed to include the formula moment is F multiplied by T sine theta multiplied by distance. That's it. All right, the last part of the question says, the radio transmitter uses radio waves to transmit radio and television programs. State one other use of radio waves. When radio waves is used in Wi-Fi, um, we use it in Bluetooth. Then radio amplitude detection and the ranging. Yeah, so that's it. That's, those are the uses of radio waves. Mm -hmm. Question number five. Many methods of generating electrical power involve the use of water. Describe one method of generating electrical power from energy stored in water. That is um, hydro energy. And um, you must have heard of um, hydroelectric energy, how to generate electrical energy from water 
that is stored in a dam. Okay, so when the water falls, as the water falls um, from the dam, the moving water will be used to drive a turbine. The turbine that is moving will be turning a shaft. That shaft is connected to a generator. And you know, I'm sure you know what a generator is. Just coils, copper coil, many tons of copper coil that is rotating or moving in a magnetic field. Once the conductor moves in a magnetic field, there will be an induced EMF, which causes current to flow in an external circuit. So that's it, and we're going to put that into writing. So that is it. Um, water is made to fall onto a turbine, and then um, this causes the turbine to rotate. And um, that's the first point. And then the, the turbine is mechanically coupled to a shaft or wheel. The point is that the turning turbine causes um, a shaft to turn. And that shaft that is turning will be turning um, the generator. The generator is just um, a coil that is inside a magnetic field. So as the coil in the magnetic field moves, then um, as the coil in the magnetic field moves, then there will be an induced EMF in the coil, okay? Yeah, so that's it. And the induced EMF is the, is the electrical power that we are trying to generate, okay? I believe um, this concept is clear. Yeah, and um, yeah, so you must have talked about um, generating electric energy from um, waterfall. Okay, yeah, and this is just a simple illustration of this process. So let me just put a light bulb here. Okay, so when water falls, okay, yeah, you have a dam. Okay, so let's just, let's just represent the dam. Water falling from the dam causes a shaft to rotate. This rotating shaft has, a, there's a coil inside. It's mechanically coupled to the coil. And in this generator, there are two big magnets, okay, which creates a magnetic field, okay, on either sides, both sides. So as the coil rotates in the magnetic field, there will be an induced EMF. If I click on this, they see mechanical energy from the waterfall, electrical energy will be generated, and that will be used to do whatever you want to use it to do. In this case, we are using it to power a light bulb. So that is just them. Um, that's just them. Um, the process. Okay. Yeah. Let's continue. The next question, part of the question, for the method you chose. In I, states one advantage and one disadvantage of generating electricity this way. What's the advantage of generating electricity this way? It is clean. It does not produce um, um, greenhouse gases. Okay? Yeah. It's a very clean source of energy. And what's the disadvantage? Um, damming, creating a dam, I mean, um, yeah, damming a, a waterfall, turning a waterfall to a dam, D-A-M, it causes flooding. Yes, it causes flooding, and um, that has um, been the issue that has been faced by some countries. And that's it. It causes flooding. State's own method of generating electrical power, for which the main source of energy is not the sun. Geothermal energy is due to um, reductive decay that is taking place in the core, okay? And then you can use um, nuclear energy or um, atomic energy. So energy generated from radioactive decay itself. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So this one is due to the radioactive, natural radioactivity that's taking place in the core of the earth. Okay. And this, this one, you can build a thermal power system. So uh, you can build a nuclear um, power station. Okay. Yeah. That would um, generate electricity from nuclear energy. Yeah, this one. Let's go. A page of a printed text is placed 18 centimeters from a converging lens or focal length 50, or focal length 35 centimeters. So I want to make sure I have the same size as the page of the paper. Yeah, I have the same size as the page of the paper. So I can take my measurements. Figure 6.1 is a scale diagram of the arrangement with each of um, the two Principal focuses. That's the um, focal point. This is the focal point. This is the focal point. This is the lens. Okay, it's they are labeled F. A lens of 1.0 centimeters on the scale diagram represents an actual length of 5 centimeters. Okay, so the scale is 1 to 5. By drawing on figure 6.1, locate the image of the page. 
produced by the lens and label it I. So how you do that, you place a meter roll here and then you draw um, a ray that is parallel to the principal axis. This is the principal axis. So you draw a ray that is parallel to this line and you start that ray from the top here. So you draw that ray, you bring it here. Okay. After getting to the, it must be straight. Please ensure you use straight line. Use a ruler, okay? I don't have, um, this, it's not possible for me to use a ruler on my laptop, on the screen of my laptop. That's why I'm just using a freehand sketch here. So after getting to the lens, this, um, lens, this ray must pass through the principal focus after reflection. So place your ruler after refraction. Place your ruler in order to draw a straight line through this part. A straight line that passes through F. Yeah, that is the path the ray of light follows. Um, also, a ray of light that's coming from this top would pass through the optical center and go straight without being deflected. There won't be a deflection. So this is how the ray goes. But you look at this ray, they continue to diverge. They don't um, come together in any way. So you have to use the ruler to produce this ray backwards. The same thing with this ray, you have to use the ruler to produce this ray backwards. Wherever they meet, that is the position of your principal focus. Okay? Yeah, wherever they meet, that shows the position of your principal focus. So let me just try to do diligent work here and then produce this first ray properly. Okay, what else do I need to do? I think this is where I have it. This is where I have it. That's where the image will be. So this should be the image. Let me use color red to draw the image. Where these two rays meet, that should be the, this should be the position of the image. So what distance do you have here? Let me see the question. Actual distance of the lens. Use figure 6.1 to determine the actual distance of image I from the lens. What's the distance between the image and the lens? Let's see. Um, this is 18 centimeters. Focal length is 35 centimeters. Let's see. Then 20, 10, 20, 30. 40. Okay, uh, what I have here is 40 centimeters. Let me confirm it. Okay, the distance we have here is 40 centimeters. So you write it down 40 centimeters. 40 centimeters. Okay, the question then proceeded to say converging lenses can be used as magnifying glasses. States whether the image produced when a lens is used as a magnifying glass is real or virtual. Explain. It is a virtual image. When you use it as a, a magnifying glass, it's a virtual image. You can see the image here is a virtual image. Why? Because ray of light do not actually come from here. Okay, so um, rays of light because rays of light do not actually meet. Where the image is formed. And also the image cannot be captured on a screen. Okay, that's one of the, that's one of the characteristics of um, virtual images. So just how someone who is long sighted may benefit from using a converging lens. And what does a converging lens do to someone who is long sighted? Someone who is long sighted can see far objects, but when an object is nearby, when an object is nearby, let this be an object, okay, and this is the eye, this is the lens of the eye, this is the back of the eye, okay. So someone who is long sighted, the image will not be formed on the retina or behind the eye, the image will be formed here. So when you put a lens here, with the, let me use color red to represent the converging lens. I'm using color red to represent the converging lens. So when you have a converging lens here, what will the lens do? Rays of light, once they strike the lens, the lens would reduce the focal length. 
okay, of the of the combination, and the image will eventually be captured on the retina or behind the eye. So that's what the lens does, okay? So um, this will no longer be the case, okay? The blue one will no longer be the case. The red one will now be the case, okay? Yeah, with the lens. So that is what the converging lens does. It's a two mark question, so you should have two valid points, okay? Yeah. So what would what would the converging lens do? The converging lens reduces the focal length of the eyes. The focal length of the combination, okay, of the two lenses, okay, of the of the entire combination of lenses. Uh, um, combination of lenses, I mean both the uh, lens or, okay, yeah. The, let me know this combination. It just reduces the focal length of the lens in your eye, okay? Fine. The lens in your eye has its focal length, but adding the converging lens to it, it reduces the focal length, focal length of, focal length of the lens in your eye, okay? So that's it. It is the focal length of the lens in your eye. Hence, um, images, images can captured on the retina, or you say behind the eye. That's all. So, two so valid points because it's a two mark question. Do not forget um, this three. Okay, two mark question. You have, you must have two valid points. The next part of the question, when a plastic rod is uncharged, sorry, a plastic rod is uncharged, when the rod is rubbed with a rolling cloth, the rod becomes negatively charged. Explain in terms of particles why the rod becomes negatively charged. Um, because, um, because the rod gains electrons, yeah the rod becomes negatively charged. The rod gains electrons. Negatively charged particles, which are the electrons, what happens to the negatively charged particles? The negatively charged particles moved from where to where, they move from the cloth, woolen cloth. They move from the woolen cloth. They move from the woolen cloth to the plastic rod. That's it. They move from the woolen cloth to the plastic rod. That's it. Yeah. The figure shows a negatively charged um, metal sphere S. What are you to do? There's an electric field surrounding S. State what is meant by an electric field. Uh, well, a force field is a region of space where the effect of, of some forces can be felt. So also, um, if you want to specify this particular field as an electric field, Say an electric field is the region in space or the region of space where an electric charge experiences a force. Okay, yeah, so if you want to define a magnetic field in a similar, you also do that in a similar manner where a magnetic. Um, where a magnet experiences a force. On figure 7.1, draw the pattern of electric field surrounding the sphere S, indicate its direction, and lines of force radiate outward from a positive charge, but for a negative charge, lines of force radiate inwards. So you just put arrows pointing inwards to show that lines of force radiate inwards. And a negative charge. That's it. The next question. Charge Z experiences a force due to the electric field surrounding S. 
On figure 7.2, draw an arrow to show the direction of this force on Z. Okay, this force on Z, you just um, like draw a straight line joining Z to the original charge. Okay, yeah. So you draw a straight line. So the, the, the force will be along this direction. That's it. So you can find the original line. The original line is not. So this is just the direction of the force, just an arrow pointing from the original charge and away from Z. Why? Because Z is an electron, right? Charge Z, ah, uh -huh. charge. Z expresses the force due to the electric surrounding S on figure. So when you do an arrow to show the direction of the, the direction of the force on Z, it will be repulsion because this is negative charge, this is also a negative charge negative charge z so negative negative repulsion so it goes this way if it was positive the arrow will be pointing this way so that's the end of that question we go straight to question number eight a cylinder is made of modeling clay the modeling clay is an electrical conductor figure is point one shows the cylinder so this is a cylinder made of modeling clay the cylinder is connected into a circuit figure eight point two shows that the circuit also includes a battery of electromotive force EMF 9 volts and a resistor P. The resistance of P is 4.0 ohms. The current in P is 1.5 amperes. Okay, so current here is 1.5 amperes. That's the current flowing here. Okay, it's fine. Calculate the magnitude X of the charge that flows through P in 600 seconds. Uh, well, Q equals to IT. I is the current, T is the time. Okay, current is 1.5 amperes, time is 600 seconds. 1.5 multiplied by 600, you get 900 coulombs. That's the charge, easy. The resistance of the cylinder, the resistance of the cylinder of modeling clay. And how do you get the resistance? Well, let us see. How do they get the resistance of this material? Let's start by getting the resistance of P. How do you get the resistance of P? R equals to voltage um, divided by current. Yeah, R equals to V over I. Wait, do you have the voltage across um, this? The resistance of P is 4 ohms. Yeah, we have the resistance of P as 4 ohms. Good. 4 ohms. Good. Now let's get the total resistance in the circuit. Total resistance is V over I. Yeah, it's gonna work now. Total resistance in the circuit is total vo voltage of the battery divided by the current flowing in the entire circuit. The voltage of the battery is nine volts. Current flow in the circuit is 1.5. Nine divided by 1.5, you have six ohms. That's total resistance. Now take note that P and R, they are resistors in series. Okay, and total resistance is the sum of resistance P plus resistance R, this modeling material, okay? So if the total resistance is six, the resistance of P is four plus R, how do you get R? You know, R will be two ohms automatically. Yeah, because six is equal to P plus R. That simply means R equals to 6 minus P. And we know already that P is 4 ohms resistor. And 6 minus 4 will give you 2 ohms. That means R is 2 ohms. Easy. The cylinder is removed from the circuit and replaced with a new cylinder made of the same modeling clay. The new cylinder is twice the length and half the cross-sectional area of the first cylinder. Calculate the time it now takes for a charge of magnitude X to flow through the um, resistor. Well, um, calculate the time. Q equals to IT. So to get the time, time equals to the quantity of charge divided by the current. How do you get the current? From the formula, V equals to IR. Then you can get the current, okay? If you want to get the time now, this is the formula we are using. 
But you cannot use this formula without getting the current because you don't know the current. Okay. So now we want to solve current. After getting the current, then you can put it into this formula. Quantity of charge is 900. The current we do not know. So you need to get the current. How do you get the current here? We know that um, I equals to V over R, voltage over resistance. Yes, um, yeah, voltage over resistance. Current is voltage divided by resistance. What's the voltage in this case? Now, in order to get the resistance, we have to bring this concept of resistivity into it. You know, um, resistivity is R A over L. That simply means the resistance is resistivity L over A. Resistance is resistivity L over A. You know, it's made up of the same material, so resistivity does not change. We don't need it. The point we are making here now is that resistance is directly proportional to length and inversely proportional to area. Okay? So now, if length is increasing, because here you were told that the length is... Um, twice the length, okay, and half is called sectional area. So if length is, has been multiplied by 2, what happens to resistance now? You know, resistance is proportional to length and inverse proportional to area. So that means um, twice the length. Twice the length now means we'll be using 2 times of the original length, okay? Yeah and half the original area. So this is what we'll be multiplying by the first resistance, okay? This is what we'll be multiplying by the first resistance, okay? Because the length is twice and the concessional area is half, okay? So we don't need this, we don't need this. What we just need is the length, resistance is proportional to length and inverse proportional to area. So if the length is twice, we multiply the length by two. We multiply the original resistance. We multiply the original resistance by two. And if the area is half, we divide the original resistance by half. Okay? Yeah, so that will be two times R divided by half. Two times, what's the original resistance? Original resistance is this value you calculated here, two ohms. Okay, yeah. So 2 times 2 divided by half. 2 times 2 is 4. 4 divided by half will give us 8. 8 ohms. So that is, it is this resistance of 8 ohms that we are using here. Okay, yeah. So I equals to voltage divided by the resistance. What's the voltage in this case? What's the voltage in this case? So the voltage, the voltage is the voltage in the from the battery, okay? The voltage from the battery remains um, 9 volts, okay? Yeah, and what will be the resistance? Um, we calculated the resistance here as, um, what's the value we got for the resistance? We got 8 ohms as the new resistance, okay? Yeah, so the new cylinder, I'm using color green for the new cylinder. The new cylinder has a resistance of 8 ohms. So what will be the total resistance now? Total resistance will now be P plus the new resistance of 8 ohms. You know P is 4 ohms resistor. Yeah, so we have 4 plus 8, which is 12 ohms. Okay, so in, the new, in, in this case, okay, when we replace the original wire with a new wire, the new wire, we now have a resistance of 8 ohms, and the total resistance in the circuit becomes 8 plus 4, which is 12. So, we go back to calculate our I. I equals to V over R. The voltage in the battery is 9 volts, and the total resistance in the circuit is now 12. 9 divided by 12, that will give us 0 0.75. I hope I'm correct. 0 0.75. Let me just confirm that. 9 divided by 12. Good. 0 0.75. So let's finish it up. So, um, yeah, I know Q equals to IT. So to get time, time equals to what? T equals to Q divided by I. 
quantity of charge is 900 charge you are looking for and the current is 0 0.75 amperes 0 0.75 now that divided by 0 0.75 should give us 1200 seconds you may decide to convert that to hours your choice so that's that that is the end of that um, question question nine many households Many household smoke alarms contain a sample of a radioactive isotope, americium-241. Americium-241 is the isotope of the element americium that has the nucleon number, which is mass number 241. States how the composition of the nucleus of americium-241 differs from the nucleus of americium-242. Uh, americium-241 has a... Um, one nucleus less than americium 242 that's all or you say um, americium 242 has one neutron more than americium 241 that's all americium 241 Good. An atom of a different element has nuclear number 241. Oh, the same mass number. Good. State two differences between the composition of the nucleus of this atom and the nucleus of americium 241. And it says the same, it has the same mass number, but it is a different atom. That simply means they won't have the same atomic number. Okay? They won't have the same atomic number. So they have different atomic number right atomic number is the number of protons in the nucleus because we are focusing on the nucleus okay yeah so they have different number of protons in their nuclei in their nuclei and what's the second difference uh, see, they have the same different number of protons and they have the same atomic number. That simply means they have um, different number of neutrons. They have different number of neutrons. All right, let's go to the next part of the question. All right, the next question says, Amalgam two four one decays to an isotope of Nep of Neptunium, Neptunium, Neptune, okay, by an alpha particle emission. Complete the equation for this decay. Well, well, Neptunium, alpha particle, alpha particle is a helium nucleus. So, alpha particle, helium has mass number of four, atomic number of two, that is set for. Now, let us balance this 93 plus two, that will be 95. So, down here we should have 95. Then um, four, okay, you minus four from this. Two, four, one, minus four. That should be two, three, seven. Seven, eight, nine times zero. Yeah, so it's balanced. One reason for using an isotope that emits alpha particle in a small detector is that alpha particles are more strongly ionizing than beta particles. Explain why alpha particles are more strongly ionizing than beta particles. Two marks question. Um, iso alpha particles they have more charge okay it has a charge of plus two while beta particle has a charge of minus one okay also okay um also they have um alpha particle do not forget that alpha particle is a helium nucleus Okay, and it is 235 times, four times more massive than a beta particle, okay? Yeah. What? No, 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 not 235. 1,875. Yeah. It is... One 
one um, one proton or one neutron is 1835 times heavier than a than an electron so alpha particle is um 1835 times four times heavier than a than a beta particle hence they have more momentum okay or you see they have um, they have more kinetic energy than beta particles than beta particles that's all yeah so you have to give two valid points because this is a two mark question so please get used to it get used to not giving one mark not get used to not giving one answer to a two marks question the isotope of neptunium produced by americium 241 is also radioactive the decay of this isotope of neptunium produces an isotope of protactinium which decays by beta emission beta particles are more penetrating than alpha particles the half-life of neptunium is longer than two million years using this information explain the advantage of using this long half-life for the use and safe disposal of a household smoke detector well long half-life it means um, um it produces less dose of radioactive um, products. Okay, yeah, so the um, alpha particles, beta particles, and gamma rays, it will be producing less dose. Okay, hence. It is not as harmful as the one with small half life. Yeah, so something having a, a large half life simply means it produces large doses of um, alpha particles beta particles and gamma rays okay what's another advantage this information to explain advantage of using the long half life for use in safe disposal yeah also um yeah um smoke detectors can easily The dispose in a cheap manner. We don't have to store um, damaged for smoke detectors or smoke detectors that you are no longer using. You don't have to store it in um, lead tanks in order to protect um, contamination by um, products of radioactivity. Why? Because it's producing less doses millions of years okay have a million years two million years that's the half life so it simply means it's just producing very little dose considering how small a smoke detector is so that means you have you have just little um dose of um that's a reactive substance so what it's producing is um it is extremely less harmful okay like the harm is so minute that it can be considered insignificant with the fact that alpha particles don't have a long distance in air, 30 centimeters. So it can be considered um, very less harmful unless you put it in your pocket and you walk about with it. Yeah, or you put it under your bed and you sleep on it and then and yeah, like you put it on your bed, and then you can say, okay, sleeping, put it under your bed um, and then sleeping there um, for for years, decades, then you can say, okay, and considering the prolonged effects, but um, disposing it at a refuse bin would have no effect. The Milky Way is one, number 10. The Milky Way is one of many billions of galaxies. Each galaxy contains many billions of stars. Stable stars transfer energy into space by emitting electromagnetic radiation from their surfaces. 
Describe what happens in the core of a stable star to release energy that is eventually transferred into space. What happens in the core of a stable star? That is the fusion of hydrogen atoms, okay? Nuclei, okay, it is a nucleus, okay? Okay, yeah, um, there will be a fusion of hydrogen nuclei to form helium nucleus. Hydrogen nuclei to form helium nucleus. So that's what happens. The three mark question what other things happen in the nucleus? What other things happen in the core of a stable star? Okay, so this is just the main thing that happens. This is just the main thing that happens. Okay, unless you want to talk about um, um, how, how the pressure is balanced by the force of gravity in the core of a stable star to release energy. But the focus now is on the release of energy, not um, what actually makes it stable. And this is exactly what makes it um, release energy, okay? Hydrogen fuses, okay? Or, or you say, or you can say there will be nuclear fusion. There will be a nuclear fusion of hydrogen atoms to form helium. That's all. That's all. On the Earth, light from a distant galaxy is observed and analyzed by astronomers. This information is used to determine the speed at which the galaxy is moving away from the Earth. Describe how the observed light is different from when it was emitted. It is red shifted. It is red shifted. Simply means um, its its wavelength has increased. Increased. Okay, pushing the light towards the red region of the electromagnetic spectrum or the visible light spectrum. State the quantity that astronomers use to determine the speed as which the galaxy is moving away. Um, okay, and um, speed is distance divided by time. Okay, yeah, and in this case, speed will be distance multiplied by Hubble's constant. Speed at which is a satellite is receding, the receding speed is distance between the satellite and the Earth, and multiplied by Hubble's constant. So state the quantity that astronomers use to determine the speed. Which quantity do they use? They use the distance between the satellite and between the galaxy and the Earth, rather. Between the galaxy and the Earth. Hubble's constant is a constant. So it's just this distance that we need. We multiply that distance by Hubble's constant, then we know the receding speed. Okay? Yeah, so the distance between the galaxy and the Earth. That's all. Okay, we go to the next question. Okay, before moving to the next question, I just confirmed something. Fine, they 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 use um they use them um, this to determine the speed, okay, state the quantity that someone used to determine the speed. There is the distance between the galaxy and the Earth. But how do they get the distance? Do astronomers measure the distance between a galaxy and the Earth? Do they have a, a very long meter rule? No. There is a concept of physics. That is that concept of red shifting. So they determine, they analyze the rays of light coming from the galaxy. And they check which... Um, region of the visible light spectrum it has gotten to you know visible lights we have um 
visible light spectrum, we have red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. So when the light, when the wavelength is stretching, the light is approaching the red region. So we see how far the red has gotten to on the red region, okay? If it has gotten to red, then the galaxy is extremely far, very, very far away from our galaxy, okay? Yeah, so it is um, that particular um, wavelength that we now use to determine the distance between that galaxy and the Earth, okay? So the number one quantity we use is just the wavelength, okay? So we, from that wavelength, we now determine the distance. And when we then insert that distance here, then we can get the receding speed of the galaxy from ours, okay? So the number one thing is the wavelength, okay? Yeah, the wavelength of the light reaching the Earth from the, from the galaxy. Yeah, so that is just that. Yeah, that's it. The wavelength of the light reaching the Earth. The next question. Okay. Let me check. I hope I'm still recording. Okay, the next question says, calculate the distance from the Earth. Calculate the distance from the Earth of a galaxy that is moving away at a speed of 1.6 times per 8 meter per second. Well, um, you know, speed is distance multiplied by Hubble's constant. So, distance will be speed divided by Hubble's constant. And the speed is um, 1.3, 1.3 times 10 to the power 7, divided by Hubble's constant. Hubble's constant is 2.2 times 10 to the power minus 18. So you take your calculator, you press 1.3 divided by 2.2, 1.3 divided by 2.2, 0 0.59 0 0.59 0 0.59 times 10 to the power 7 minus minus 18 that will be 25 so our answer will be 5.9 times 10 to the power shifting the decimal point to the right I'll minus 1 from this 24 meters 5.9 times 10 to the power 24 meters. Yeah. Calculate an estimate of the age of the universe. Give your answer in years. Yeah. Age of the universe, um, age is equal to, my handwriting is not looking nice. It doesn't matter. Fine, it matters. Age is one of our Hubble's constants. Yeah. Which is one of our Hubble's constants. We have Hubble's constant as 2.2. Times 10 to the power minus 18. So I'll just do 1 divided by 2.2. 1 over 2.2. 0 0.454545. So I have 0 0.45. 0 0.45 times 10 to the power 1 minus, minus 18. No, sorry. No 1. 0, okay? Because this one times 10 is power 0. So 0 minus, this division introduces a minus, minus, minus 18. That will be plus 18. Okay, so that will be 4.5 times 10 is the power, let's see. I'll remove one from here because I'm shifting my decimal point to the right. So 10 is the power 17. Uh, hold on. That will be 4.5 times 10 to the power 17 seconds. The time was being years, so I have to convert to years. Um, let me see. Let me start with 4.5 times 10 to the power 7, and then I multiply this by 10 to the power 10. 10 plus 7 gives me 17. 4.5 times 10 to the power 7. 4.5 times 10 to the 
times 10 is the power 7 is even 6 zeros. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. I want to convert this from second to minutes. I will convert from minutes to hour. I will convert from hour to a day. 24 hours make a day. And I will convert from a day to a year, 65. So I'm converting this to years now. Let's see how many years I have. I have 14 years. I have 14 years. Let me check if I've done the correct thing. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I did eight instead of seven. I did eight instead of seven. So that's why I got um, the number of zeros there is not correct. Okay, four point five should be forty five. One two three. One two three four five six. This is four point five times ten to the power seven. Now I want to convert it to from second to minutes by multiplying by sixty. Okay, I'll convert to hour by multiplying by sixty again. I will convert to a day and I convert to a year 365. These are you convert to years. So let me get the value in year. Ah, 1.4 years. 1.43 in years. 1.4. So I have um 1.43. 1.43 and tens of our 10 years. That's it. Let me look at the values I have. All my values are to two significant figures. So I'm putting mine to two, two significant figures, 1.4. I'm cutting the three off, two significant figures, times 10 is about 10. This is my answer in years. Okay? Yeah, so that's how I'm getting my answer here. Okay, so that is the end of this um, first question. If there's any question you do not understand, make sure you watch the video on it again. And if you have further questions, you may reach out to me through my email, okay? Physics dot four dot everybody at gmail dot com. Thank you for joining us today. And um, ensure you refer your friends to this video so that they can also learn and make excellent results, excellent grades in the exam. See you on our next video. Ensure you subscribe to this YouTube channel and do have a nice day. Goodbye. I wish you excellent grades in the exam.